And hello, Facebook. Prophet David Taylor here for our second Thursday night teaching, always entitled No More Genies. Okay? All right, now, for those of you that are new, please uh, like and share when you come on if you're watching this live. Because uh, right now I'm live on Facebook and Periscope. And then you can watch the replay on both. My Periscope is also simultaneously cast in my Twitter stream. Excuse me, PDTSOTC is my Twitter. And then you can find the replay on YouTube. Excuse me, I need to take a drink. And welcome to those of you listening to me on the podcast as well, because I also put out a podcast of this teaching. Because whenever the Lord sends out a prophetic word, it needs to go worldwide. It needs to reach as many people as it can. Because remember, the word of God, uh, whether we're talking about exegetic preaching or prophetic preaching or, or whatever kind of teaching or prophesying we're talking about, it needs to go out to as many people as possible. Okay, so they can have a chance to hear the Lord because all it takes is one word from the Lord to completely turn your life around. Okay, so on second Thursday nights, what I do is something called NMG. That's why you see the hashtag NMG or something called No More Genies. And the reason it's called No More Genies is because I've discovered by living that um, and personal experience that Many of us are taught or have a genie concept of God. Okay, and the genie concept of God is where you think that faith is magic and where you think you can live any kind of way you want and then just say the magic words or say a magic prayer or wave the magic wand or whatever and God's just going to wave his hand over your circumstances and fix all your problems and remove all your consequences and all that and doesn't, God doesn't work that way. He's not a genie. Okay, he doesn't follow us. We follow him. He does not bow down before us. We bow down before him. Okay. And so uh, I strongly encourage you to go back to the beginning of the series because I've been teaching this now for about two years. Go back to the beginning of the series and look at the very first one. I go into extensive detail in that very first video about what, you know, how deep a genie concept is and how it has perpetrated our consciousness and how people have let their children die because of genie concept. People have refused to take their kids to the hospital or refused to give their kids medicine because they kept saying God's going to heal them, God's going to heal them. But you can't force God's hand and make him heal the way you want him to heal, okay? You know, maybe God was telling you to take your medicine or maybe, maybe God was telling you, maybe God was telling you to take that child to the hospital. Maybe that was the thing to do. Maybe surgery is what you needed. Why do you think God gives us the gifts of doctors and people in the medical field, and people that spend their lives studying and repairing and maintaining the human body. Why do you think we have that in the earth if the only way God was going to heal was through divine healing on the spot? Even some of the people in the Bible, like, for example, the woman with the issue of blood. In English, it says, she said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. In Greek, the verb tense indicates, <clears throat> indicates that she continued to say, so in other words, she didn't just say it one time. And when you read that whole story, she had spent all her money going all to, to all the doctors she knew how, and they couldn't help her. So then she had to step back and use her faith. And remember, that was a miracle where the Lord wasn't even looking at her. She pulled that out of him. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that <clears throat> so much of what we've been taught is just wrong. It's just wrong, and then it ends up cost costing people, and then they have what they call a faith crisis. Okay, you're not having a crisis of faith. What you believe wasn't right from the jump. Let me say that one more time after I hit this wall. <laughs> you're not having a crisis of faith. It's just that what you believed was wrong from the jump because it wasn't biblical. It wasn't what the Bible actually says. It was some stuff you heard in church or some... You know, maybe you heard Mama Nim say, or, you know, my, my Paul Paul used to say, or, you know, uh, Grandma Mabel the church said this, whatever. But it's what thus saith the Lord. It's what the scripture says. That's the point. So that's the point of me doing uh, this series, this continuing series called No More Genies, because I'm trying to move us from, a, you know, a mythology concept, a mythological concept of Christianity, 
and trying to move us from hearsay and tradition, that kind of thing. And let's read what the Bible actually says and let's look at what the people in the Bible actually did to get in the will of God, to get their blessing and to get their miracle. Okay? And what I've been teaching on for several months, this last uh, segment has been called We Do It Wrong, but the basic idea is we preach and teach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we don't preach and teach the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. Because we preach born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That's not what the Lord preached. <laughs> what the Lord preached was the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. That's what the Lord preached. Okay? And so I've been teaching extensively on the parables that Jesus told about the kingdom of heaven because that was the crux of his message. The crux of his message was the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. And he only mentioned born again one time in John chapter 3 when he was talking to Nicodemus. And he mentioned it in the context of saying, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So once again, it's still uh, uh, a lot of misconceptions. And we're still preaching born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss out, miss out, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. But we're not <clears throat> preaching and teaching what Jesus preached and taught. Okay? So what I've been working on is I've been working on the parables of the kingdom that Jesus taught. So we've taught on uh, just about everyone in Matthew chapter 13. We taught them on the parable of the sower, of the wheat and the tares, of the mustard seed, of the yeast and the leaven, the hidden treasure, pearl of great price, the dragnet, and a homeowner with a storeroom. Okay, today we're going to teach on something that's very familiar, but hopefully you'll get some new insights, some things you haven't seen before. Okay, and we're going to teach on the Managing Business Accounts Receivable Parable, also known as uh, the Parable of the Talents. Okay, now, uh, this one, like I said, is really, really familiar. And people think it's just about forgiveness, and it is about forgiveness, but there's a lot more in it that we can harvest, okay? So, let's look at, um, well, in the scriptures, they also call it the parable of the unmerciful servant. So, let's look at Matthew chapter 18, a reading out of the NIV. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to start at verse 21. We're going to start at Matthew 18, 21, and we're going to go through verse 35. Reading out of the NIV. Then Peter, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times, or it says seven times seven in other translations. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold or 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the ma master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred silver coins, or a hundred denarii, in other translations. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Then verse 35, the Lord said, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Let's pray. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this night. Thank you for an opportunity to come into your presence by faith, Lord. I should forgive me for any sin, Lord, by thought, word, and deed. Cleanse me by the blood of Jesus. Fill me with the Holy Ghost, O oh God. Breathe through me. Fill my mouth, uh, my mind, my heart, my words, uh, my tongue, my hands, O oh God. Breathe through me. Come through every part of my body. And open up your word to us. Open up the prophetic understanding of this, O oh God. And let what you want said be said. Let your be, will be done. Not my will, but thine be done. And I'm happy to be a servant in your kingdom, O oh God. So have your way on tonight as we move forward to try to truly understand your kingdom and what you taught when you walked the earth as a man. And we thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen, amen. So, so yes, this parable is about unforgiveness, but there's so much more in there, okay? First thing we need to look at is we need to look at the 10,000 talents that the first servant owed to the master. How much money is that in today's terms? Okay. Well, in today's terms, it's about, hold on, I have the figure here. Uh, it's about $10 million <laughs> in today's terms. So if you were like in $10 million in debt, and then... So it says in the denarii uh, is a day's wages. So if you order them 100 denarii, $100, is about $600. So we're looking at $10 million versus about $600. So first of all, the Lord shows us the, the, the huge gap between the debts owed. But there's something else in here that the Holy Spirit showed me that I want to share with you. The Lord is trying to show us here the enormity and the weight and the cost of sin. Because the way the parable is framed, it's talking about um, uh, the king who wants to settle accounts with his servants. So to translate, that's talking about Father God and our accounts before him. Because if you don't know, God records, uh, he literally writes down in his books, everything you say, everything you do, and every motive you have when you do it. So God does, just not, God does not just write down your actions. God also writes down your motives, and God writes down your words. And when God judges you, both in this life and the life to come, he always judges you out of the book of your life, the book of your deeds. Out of your own mouth, God always judges you. According to the work of your own hands, God always judges you. If you didn't know that, okay? And it's not just after you die. That's final judgment when you're in the afterlife. It's right now while you live. When you look at when God was pronouncing judgment in the garden, the first thing he said was, because thou hast done this. He said that to Adam, because you have done this, because you have done this, then everything that happened because of Adam's choice to sin. So what the Holy Spirit showed me here is that the Lord is trying to show us the enormous weight of sin. And I'm sure, because I know I've done it, and I know we all do it. We underestimate the enormous cost of sin. I can't tell you the number of people I've heard say that when they, when they get to heaven, they want to find Adam and slap him. And they just want to slap him. Yeah, how could you do that? How could you do this to us? You know, you gave us domestic violence and you gave us rape and you gave us racism. And you gave us, uh, you know, herpes and HIV and rheumatoid arthritis and all kinds of cancer and global war and, and pestilence and disease and brown water and contaminated water and all that happened the day that Adam ate that fruit and sinned and separated himself from God. When he separated himself from God, he sinned and became a sinner and he also let sin and death and the grave and hell into our existence because when God created us, Sin and death and the grave and hell didn't have any power over us because we were one with God. We were not in sin. But once Adam sinned and became a sinner and let all that stuff in, then sin came in and the wages of sin is death, which is why we now die. But then the grave came in and the grave is the thing that holds your dead body, your corpse, and hell came in. Hell is the thing that holds your spirit and your soul. All that came in the day that Adam ate that fruit. 
I want to remind you that Adam did not beat his wife. Adam did not cut his wife. Adam did not blaspheme God with his lips. That's not what Adam did. All Adam did was eat a piece of fruit. But the fruit he ate was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God told him that the day he ate that fruit, he was going to die. What the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented was mankind's ability to grow your own conscience. When God created us, we had no self-consciousness. That's why we were naked without shame, and we were one with God. So when you saw Adam, you saw Jesus. And when you saw Jesus, you saw Adam. Like that, there was no difference between the two. That's why when Jesus became a man, they called him the last Adam, because Jesus is the reboot. He's the reboot of the human race. Jesus is what Father, Son, and Holy Ghost had in mind when they first made us. That's who Adam was when he was first created. But God said, if you want to grow a conscience, son, if you want to separate from me, if you want to live apart from me, I give you that option. You can go out on your own. You can grow a conscience, which is why as soon as they sinned, they got self-conscious and they knew they were naked. And also why that's when sight walking was first born. Because we think walking by sight is natural and walking by faith is crazy. And God says, y'all got that backwards. Walking by faith is natural and walking by sight is crazy. But when Adam sinned, they got flipped and mankind began to, do, to depend on his senses instead of on the word of God. All that is what happened when Adam sinned. And when he sinned, he let Satan, sin, death, the grave, and hell in to our existence. Because they existed, but they weren't a part of our lives. Remember that the devil was in the Garden of Eden, but remember he did not overpower Adam and Eve. He gave Eve some new information and made her question what she believed and deceived her, and she bought it. Adam knew that it wasn't right, but he went with his wife anyway. But the one thing the devil did not do was overpower them. He deceived her, and then Adam went with the deception. So God told Adam that the day you separate yourself from me is the day you're going to die. In, in English, it says, dying thou shalt die. But in Hebrew, it actually says, excuse me, in English, it says, thou shalt surely die. But in Hebrew, it actually says, dying thou shalt die. So in other words, what God actually said to Adam was that he was going to create a cycle of death if he ate that fruit. So that's why now upon the earth is a cycle of death. That's why things are born and dying and born and dying, and that's why we're born, and that's why we die, because that's what God said would happen if Adam separated himself from God. All that happened when he ate that fruit. And I know, I know that a lot of believers don't understand that. A lot of people still don't understand. The first thing people say is that if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? The answer to that question is because mankind shows evil. Because God said life and death in front of Adam and Eve Eve listened to the devil and chose death first, and then Adam knew that wasn't right, but followed her anyway. And when Adam sinned, because he was the head, that's when the fall happened. So the reason there's evil in this world is because Adam chose death. But you don't have to go all the way back to Adam. You can just look in the mirror. Because you can't tell me that you haven't been in situations in your life where you had a choice between life or death, good or evil, blessing or cursing, and you always chose life. And you always chose good. And you always chose blessing because you're lying. You've been in situations in your life where you had choices in front of you and sometimes you chose death with a smile on your face. Sometimes you chose cursing. Sometimes you chose evil with a smile on your face. So you don't have to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden to understand why there's evil in this world. You can just look in the mirror because we have a choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice and brought it into our existence. But even since that time, when we're faced with that same choice, we don't always make the choice unto life. We don't. Even with something like food. How many times have you been in a situation where you say, I know I should eat healthy and this is a healthy choice, but I want that. How many times have you done that? I've done that many a day. <laughs> uh, if they say you are what you eat, then I should have been turned into a pizza by now. But uh, That's another conversation. So anyway, so the point I'm trying to make to you in all that is that this is how all this came about. And what the Lord is trying to show us is the enormous cost of sin. That if God were ever to show you your account in terms of the sins you have to pay for, it would be, if you translated it into money, in the tens, the hundreds of millions, the billions, the hundreds of billions, the trillions, the enormous cost of sin. And so people have said, 
Then when they get to the glory realm, they want to find Adam and slap him. I was about to tell you, that's totally unfair. That's a totally unfair statement. Do you know why that's an unfair statement? Because Adam and Eve had to walk and live by faith the same way we do. Do you think Adam really had any idea of what he was unleashing when he ate that fruit? Adam had no frame of reference. What had he seen die before that point? Remember, he'd never even cut himself. He'd never even seen his own blood. Remember that before sin, you could just go and pet an alligator. The alligator could, you know, just walk up right beside you and y'all have a nice conversation. Remember that the lion could lay down with deers and gazelles. They were friends. They weren't food. Before sin, because there was nothing carnivorous in the earth, before sin happened. And then when sin happened, you know, before sin, a few minutes ago, the eagle and the mouse were friends. Then, hello, 348584. And then when sin happened, the eagle looked at mouse and said, I think I'm kind of hungry. Okay? And remember that when God was pronouncing the curse, God told the serpent that thou art cursed above all cattle. That means all the cattle of the field got cursed too. I know them cows, when God said that, I know them, them cows looked up and said, hmm? I know them cows was like, what did we do? We didn't do nothing. But the snake, either the snake or the Adam, or, or Father Adam, got the animal kingdom cursed. The reason the snake got cursed is because the snake let the devil jump in his body and speak through his mouth and use his face because uh, the devil will always hide himself beside something behind something else so you don't know it's him so when the devil was speaking to eve he could speak in an audible audible voice because he was in a physical body and not in the spirit because there's a way you hear in the spirit is not the same as the sound waves hitting your eardrums and your eardrums interpreting uh those signals and when you come on please like and share please like and share this video with as many platforms as you can because whenever the word of, God, word of God is going forth, we want as many people as possible to hear it. So, you know, there's a way you hear in the spirit, but it's not the sound waves hitting your eardrums. But the way you hear in the natural is the sound wave hitting your eardrum, and your eardrum and all the, the villi, the hearing your ears vibrating, sending the signal to your brain so you can interpret it as sound. So the devil set it up so that Eve could hear his voice that way, audibly, like you're hearing my voice now. And <clears throat> the devil was hiding his face behind the serpent so when god passed on judgment he cursed the snake for letting the devil jump in his body and use his mouth to deceive the woman but it wasn't just the snake that got cursed the whole animal kingdom it's because god said thou art cursed above all cattle so that's why there's that fierceness in nature now that's why there's carnivores that's why all the stuff that you need to be afraid of when it comes to animals, because it wasn't like that before sin. Whatever animals you don't like, whatever animals uh, you're afraid of before sin, there was nothing to be afraid of. So Adam could walk up to the tiger and pet the tiger just like you would a common house cat, okay? Because there was no sin. But after sin happened, and now all of a sudden predators come into existence, and now the animal kingdom turns on each other. Instead of even leaves and grass and berries and nuts and shrubs, and all that, which is what we were all supposed to eat, fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, grains, uh, sin entered, and then uh, carnivores happened, and now flesh is killed, and blood is shed, and meat is consumed. All that is because of sin. You see that? And so, what I'm trying to tell you is, Adam had no idea that's what was about to happen. God, according to the scripture, did not give Adam details. He just said, the day you eat that fruit, you shall surely die, or dying I shall die. Adam had no frame of reference to what death was. Do you really think he knew? He was unleashing all the stuff he was unleashing? See, so Adam and Eve had to live by faith just like we did. So to say that when you wanted to get to heaven, you just want to slap him because of all the trouble he brought us is not fair. You think he saw all that? You think he knew he was unleashing World War I and World War II and possibly World War III and and nuclear weapons, and Agent Orange, and Napalm, and the A-bomb. Because I've been to Japan, I've been to Hiroshima, the people still there being born with A-bomb disease, and they have a big museum where they ask the other leaders of the world to stop all nuclear uh, warhead testing because of what they went through in Hiroshima and what they're still going through. 
Remember that World War II happened mid-century in the 20th century. There are people still being born with Avon disease to this day. Do you think Adam understood that's what he was unleashing? That's what I'm trying to get you to see. The enormous cost of sin. We have no idea. I'll give you another example from the scriptures. And then I'll give you some examples from real life. One of the examples from the scriptures is, of course, Esau. If you don't know the story of Jacob and Esau, Abraham was the man that God called at 75 years old. His name was Abram when God called him. And God told that man, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. If you believe me, if you walk uprightly before me, if you keep my covenant, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to give you so many children, it's going to be as the sands on the beach and as the stars in the sky. God gave him his natural child, but God waited until that man was 100 years old and his wife was 90 <laughs> to give him that child. And that miracle child, his name was Isaac. And Isaac means laughter because Sarah, they laughed when God first told them they were going to have it. And I'm sure Sarah was tickled to deliver a baby at 90 years of age. A, literally a miracle baby. That man, Isaac, married a woman named Rebekah and they had twins. Their sons were named Jacob and Esau. Esau was kind of a, a, a hunter, an outdoorsman, a little bit of a jock, <laughs> you know. Jacob was most definitely a mama's boy. He was not his father's favorite. He was his mother's favorite. He hung out with her and her side of the family. Definitely much more of a mama's boy than Esau. These are the twin sons of Isaac. Isaac is the son of Abraham. So that blessing that God promised Abraham was passed down to Isaac. And then it came time for Isaac to pass that blessing from God down to his son. And that son was Esau's by birthright because Esau was the oldest twin. Esau came out first, and Jacob actually came out uh, holding Esau's heel. <laughs> That's why they named him Jacob, because it means a planter. Uh, but anyway, you're supposed to be named after your destiny, by the way. But anyway, so that birthright belonged to Esau by order of birth. He didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to earn it. He was the oldest son. So that blessing that God promised Abraham, it was then passed down to Isaac. It was on, upon Isaac's death. Or before Isaac died, obviously, he needed to pass that blessing on to the next generation because that's the blessing God had put on their family, that they would be multiplied, become like the stars of the sky. One day, Esau was out hunting in the field, and he came in. He was hungry. He probably wasn't just hungry. He was probably hangry. Hangry ain't the same as hungry. When you're hungry, you just want to eat. When you hangry, you so hungry, you angry. <laughs> okay. I'm laughing because I have been there, and I know some of y'all have been there too. You've been so hungry, you mad. <laughs> so Esau came in from hunting, probably hangry. And Jacob had been cooking, and Jacob uh, fixed a pot of soup or stew or lentils, depending on which translation you look at. Lentils are more so beans. Could have been a pot of beans, kind of pot of bean soup. He also might have had some meat in it, though, because Esau was really good at fixing venison, venison, which was dressed deer. Okay, so Jacob might eat, so it could be soup, could be beans, lentils, could have had a little venison in it. All Esau knew was that he wanted some. I'm hangry. <laughs> I've been hunting all day and I need some grub. <laughs> so he said, brother, give me some of your soup. Bro, I'm about to die, man. You know, give me some of that soup. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright first. That escalated quickly. And Esau said, what did you say? Jacob said, I said. He said, I'm just stirring the pot, making sure the vapors get all in his nose. He said, I said, sell me your birthright, and I'll give you some soup. And then Esau said, eh, birthright, birthright. <laughs> what do I need with that birthright? I'm so hungry, I'm about to die. And that birthright, what good is it doing me? So sure. And Jacob said, swear to me, brother. Swear to me that, that you have given me your birthright. Swear to me. And Esau said, I swear I give you my birthright. Now give me some soup. So Jacob said, all right. And poured him some soup and gave his hungry brother some soup. Esau ate that soup, got up, went away, and acted like nothing ever happened. What happens next in the story is that uh, Rebecca was a, a schemer, a trickster, a player. So she came up with the plan because Esau was hairy, 
to get some animal skins, put them on Jacob's forearms so that when Isaac touched Jacob, he would feel like Esau because Isaac was going blind and he could no longer visually see his sons. So Rebekah put them foreskins, the Mary foreskins, on Jacob's arm, sent her in the tent and said, go get your brother's birthright. So Isaac was about to give out the blessing. Isaac knew in his spirit it was time for him to give it out. Isaac was getting older, losing his eyesight, he couldn't see. So Jacob came in the, in, the, in the tent, cooked his father some of that venison, some of that dressed deer that he liked, and said, Father, I'm ready to receive my birthright. And Isaac said, is that Esau? And Jacob said, yes, me, Esau. And then Isaac grabbed his hands and said, let me feel you. And Isaac said, well, the, the hands are Esau's, the arms are Esau's, but the voice is Jacob's. And Jacob was like, no, I'm Esau. I assure you. Isaac can't see him. So Isaac said, okay. And then Isaac pronounced that blessing on Jacob. And Jacob said, thank you, Father, and left the tent. About an hour later, Esau comes in. Talking about, Father, I'm ready to receive my blessing. And Isaac was like, who is that? And Esau was like, it's me, Esau. And Isaac was like, oh, no. Uh, son, your brother has stolen your birthright. He came in his tent before, and, and he had hairy arms like you do, and I thought it was him, and I blessed him. And then Esau started crying. And Esau said, but, but Father, I, I fixed your venison. I, I, I fixed that deer the way you like it, and don't you have a blessing left for me? And Isaac said, I'm sorry, son. It's a one-time blessing. I've already conferred it upon your brother. And from that time until they met later in their lives, Esau lost his mind. Esau went crazy when he realized what he'd done. Because I want you to understand slash remember that God himself referred, when he, when he was speaking to the children of Israel, he would always say, I'm the God of your fathers. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was supposed to be Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But for a bowl of soup, that man gave away his place in history. One more time. That man gave away his place in history. That man gave away his place with God. God had made a covenant with Abraham, and God referred to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because Jacob went there and stole a birthright because Esau said, sure, you can have it. Now, do you understand that for the rest of his life, Esau was crying for the rest of his life. Esau cut his place out of history. He lost his place in history. He could have been one of the three patriarchs named in the name of God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the blessing to be Abraham and Isaac and then that third son, grandson, to where the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, refers to your family to identify himself? Just think about that. Just think about if God in heaven referred to your uh, papa and your dad in his name when he was trying to help you understand who he was. Jesus even says in the New Testament that in the wedding supper of the Lamb in the world to come, he's going to sit down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There they are again, not Esau. That means that even in the afterlife, that blessing is still not Esau's. So, why did I tell you that? I told you that to help you understand, once again, the enormity of sin that Adam didn't realize what he was unleashing upon us. Eve didn't realize there's a whole lot of things that women go through to this day because of the curses God put on women. Because when Eve sinned against God, God released some very specific curses on women that women deal with to this day. One of them is going through the gates of hell in childbirth. When God created Eve, God created Eve with childbirth with no, la with no labor pains. She could have a baby. She could have as many babies as she needed to because they had a planet to populate. He said, be fruitful and multiply, remember? Eve could have as many babies as she wanted to with no labor pains. She could just pop them out. And when Eve sinned against God, one of the things God said was going to happen to her and all women, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy, thy pain in childbirth and in sorrow and travail 
shall thou bring for a children. That means all that stuff that women go through when you're waiting uh, for your cervix to dilate to 10 centimeters and when you feel the contractions that's your womb opening so the baby can come out. That didn't hurt before sin. It just happened naturally. There was no pain. You know, you didn't need an epidural. Just your body would open so you could push the baby out. That's what Eve had was childbirth without labor pain. And then she sinned against God. Then God said, this is part of your judgment. And it's still on women now. That's the enormity of sin. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. One of the things that God said to Adam, although it applies to all of us. He said, for dust thou art, and, to dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. Why do you think? There's such a great tendency for your body to break down as you get older and then decompose after you die. God never meant for any of that to happen. You know, when they dig up, a corpse is decomposed. Ain't nothing left but the skull and the bones. And sometimes if you get super, super, super old, sometimes your body's already begun to break down. That was never supposed to happen. But God told Adam, because you sinned against me, you're going to turn back into dust now. I used dust to build you and you could have lived forever if you picked a tree of life. But you didn't. You chose death. And now you're going to turn back into dust. That's why it happens. You think Adam understood all that? God just told him, don't eat that fruit. Because today you eat that fruit, you're going to die. That's all the scripture records God is saying. Okay? So I told you about Adam. I told you about Esau. I'm going to give you one more Bible example. Because I want to move on with the rest of the lesson. <clears throat> Other Bible example I want to give you is Judas. Okay? <clears throat> when before Father, Son, and Holy Ghost made the world and made everything that they made and made us, because remember, they made humans last. Before they did all that, they had already agreed in the councils of eternity past that they would create a plan of salvation. They would create what we call getting saved and becoming born again. They had already decided before they ever made us that if mankind ever sinned and separated from them, that they were going to redeem us and buy us back and give us a chance to be one with them again, even though we were sinners. So that means the Son of God had already agreed to become Jesus Christ before they ever made us. So I want you to understand that the first advent of Christ, Jesus being born on earth as a baby, is not a once-in-a-lifetime experience, because that would mean it could happen again. It was not a once-in-a-generation experience because, like, you know, Michael Jordan, Whitney Houston, that's a once-in-a-generation voice. The, people like that will rise again, but normally there's only one like that. You know, that level of greatness, there's only normally one like that in a generation. But Jesus Christ being born was not once in a lifetime and not once in a generation. It was once for all of time and eternity. <laughs> Never before had God come to earth as a man, as a human, never before had God been born through the womb of a woman and put on human flesh, and never again will that happen. So if you're Mary, you had a once in all creation opportunity to give birth to the Christ child. Never happened before, never will happen again. If you're the 12 men because also there were women that followed Jesus. Remember, they followed him, supported him, food and money and all that. If you didn't know that, there's a group of women that followed Jesus. So it wasn't just the 12 disciples, the guys. It was a group of women as well. But the Bible tells us that the Lord stayed in prayer all night before he picked his 12. If you were one of the 12 men that got to follow Jesus, you had a once in all creation opportunity to see God as a man. To see him in a form where you could actually look at him. Because if you saw God as God... He would burn up everything. He's too bright. He, if, if God unveiled his full glory, all of his creation would melt from the brightness of his glory, which is why God stays invisible. Because you can't look at him. He's so bright. If we can't look at the sun and the sun is something he made, what must he be? So God is so bright. You can't even look at him. He, he would melt everything he made if he just showed up in full glory. And I've heard people say, well, I want God to show up. No, you don't. Everything you know, just, it would just be like Raiders of the Lost Ark, except 10 times worse. Okay, so, but he put on a human form so we could actually see him and hear his voice audibly, like you're hearing my voice now, and touch him, and, and, and eat some fish and chips with him, and hang out with him, and all that. And those 12 men 
10, 2, those 12 men got a once in all creation opportunity to actually walk and talk with God as a man. That hurts my brain. That hurts my brain. That means you could ask Jesus any question you wanted. What would you give for an opportunity to ask Jesus any question you wanted to ask him face to face like you're looking at me right now? And he hung out with him every day for three years. And he blessed Peter with money to pay his taxes. And he walked on the water in front of him. And he fed the 4,000 and he fed the 5,000. And he opened the blinded eyes and he healed the lepers. And he healed the woman with the issue of blood. And he forgave the Samaritan woman. And he healed the Gadarene demoniac and cast all the demons out of him. And so many demons that 2,000 pigs ran into the sea. And then John said, uh, the apostle John that wrote the gospel of John, said that this isn't everything that Jesus did. John said that Jesus did so much, we actually couldn't write down everything that the Lord did. The scripture says that John didn't imagine the world itself could contain the books. So in other words, Jesus did so much more than, than is recorded in scripture from the testimony of an eyewitness that walked with him and talked with him. And Judas, in the face of all that, sold him out. In the face of the opportunity to see God in the flesh, going once, going twice, only going to happen this one time, never going to happen again. If you've had a vision for the Lord, you've seen him in the spirit. These men saw him in the flesh. Like they put their hands on Jesus' hands and they listened to his voice. And Apostle John put his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. Like that. They knew the Lord like that. And Judas sold him out. Judas betrayed him into the hands of the Romans, which were the ones that, were, were, that arrested him. But the Jews did not have a policy that allowed them to crucify people they didn't like. And they were under the Roman government, so they couldn't really do to Jesus what they wanted to do to him. So uh, the crime that the Jews hated Jesus for was blasphemy, because he said he was one with God. He said, before Abraham was, I am. That's why the Jews said they couldn't take Jesus anymore because they felt like that was the highest crime to make oneself one with Yahweh and one with Jehovah. Because remember, the Jews feared God so much they wouldn't even write the vowels because they still do that now. When they write Yahweh, they don't write the vowels. When they write Jehovah, they just write the consonants because they fear God's name so much until they won't even write it or say it. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus said, that same God. Jesus said, that's me. And they said, blasphemy, this man is crazy. We got to get rid of him. But they wanted the Romans to do it because the Romans had the death by crucifixion. So they wanted to get Jesus arrested, tried, and convicted by the Romans. So that's why they went to the Romans and they accused Jesus of treason. Uh, they said that he said he was a king. And the very common understanding was that we have no king but Caesar. That was the law of the land. You couldn't speak. It's not like America where you can speak out against leadership, back in that day, you could not speak out against Caesar or else they'd kill you. So they said that Jesus had spoken out against Caesar, and that's why the Romans came to arrest Jesus. Judas is the one that sold him out to that system. And they asked Judas, how are we going to know which one is him? And Judas said, well, the one that I give a kiss to. That's him. That's the rabbi. That's the Jesus that everybody loves, and that's the blasphemer. That's the one that said he didn't have any king that he was above Caesar. And for that, uh, they gave Jesus 30 pieces of silver. That's where that comes from. You may have heard the term 30 pieces of silver. That's where it comes from. That was the money they gave to Judas to sell out Jesus to the Romans. And Judas Iscariot betrayed God in the flesh. And after he did it, he realized what he'd done and tried to get the money back. And they said, that's your problem. You see that, what's I got to do it? And Judas killed himself. There's two different accounts in the Bible. One account in the Bible says he hung himself. And another account in the Bible says his guts burst out on the field. And that's why they call the field the field of blood. So I have to do some more research to see. Because some people have said he hung himself and then his guts burst out. You know, like on The Walking Dead. Uh, so I have to see how we reconcile those two accounts. But the point I'm trying to make is that that man had a chance to see Jesus physically. And that was only going to happen one time. And he sold them out. So now I've given you three examples of people that didn't understand the enormity of sin. Adam, Esau, and Judas. But fourth example is you can just look at yourself. Just look in the mirror. 
There have been times in your life when you were faced with a choice and you made the choice of sin and you probably laughed when you did it. You probably thought it wouldn't be that big of a deal and you enjoyed the pleasure. You enjoyed the pleasure to the extreme and then the bill came. And what that sin cost you to this day just makes you shake your head. If you could go back in time and live your life over, you would have made a different choice. This is what I'm trying to tell you that this parable is about. Not just the forgiveness, but the enormity of sin and the enormity of sin on our accounts before God. And the Lord says that in this parable that the master uh, of the servant that owed uh, 10,000 talents, which is about 10 million bucks in today's money, said that he was going to go uh, and everything he had to be sold to pay that debt. I still don't know how he could have paid that debt. And the man fell on his knees and begged for forgiveness and said, I'll pay back everything, but be patient with me. And then the master took pity on him and canceled the debt. Jesus is trying to show you this is what Father does with us because of Jesus' blood. That those millions upon billions upon trillions of sins that you've done in your lifetime. Imagine living to be 100 years old. Do you think you could, you could handle a sin count? Every time you sin with your lips, every time you sin with your body, every time you sin in your heart. You think you could, you, you could stand a look at that book if God showed you your book? You think you could stand that? And the scripture is teaching here that the, the master took pity on him and canceled the debt. He, can, oh, he canceled that debt. Canceled the debt. And so the Lord is trying to teach us that. Oh, and yeah, there's one more point I want to make in there. And that is, <clears throat> we always say that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That's true. That's not incorrect. But that's a little bit incomplete. Jesus did not just die on the cross, sorry, for our sins. Jesus died on the cross for sin. He did not just die on the cross for our sins. He died for sin. That's why there was a crown of thorn placed on his head, because when God pronounced a curse in the garden, he told Adam that the ground was going to fight him now, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee. That means before sin, the ground did not fight Adam. That means Adam could plant seed and get a harvest, get crops, get wheat, get grain, get corn, get whatever he needed without a problem. After sin, God said, the ground's going to fight you now. That's why there's weeds. If you ever wonder why no matter where on earth you live, you're going to have a weed problem until you deal with them, because God put the curse of weeds on earth, because there was no weeds <laughs> before sin. I know, I bet you didn't even know that weeds growing out your garden was a curse, but they are. That's why they always show up, because the ground is cursed. So that is why Jesus, they put a crown of thorns on his head. Jesus was actually redeeming the ground, the very earth itself, because he did not just die on the cross for our sins. That makes it sound like he just died for the wrong that people do. He did, but he died on the cross for sin, its very existence in the earth. So he died to redeem the ground. That's what the crown of thorns were. Now there's a whole other teaching about the seven wounds of Christ, the crown, one in each hand, that's three, the uh, nail, uh, the spear in the side, that's four, five and six in the feet, and then how he sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, that's seven. Seven times that Jesus bled. There's a whole other teaching. I don't have time to do that night. But every time the Lord sheds his blood, there's redemption. So that's why he had a crown of thorns on his head when he died. That's why he got beaten so badly, because he was taking the punishment that sin deserves. But when he was on the cross, death, hell, the sin in the grave, sickness, poverty, all the things that, that happened in this earth were actually being poured into his body. So Jesus' death was actually more brutal than what met the eye. Now, when you read the scripture, the Bible indicates clearly that when they beat Jesus and hung him on the cross, he didn't look human anymore. So it doesn't, it doesn't look like the crucifix pictures that we see. If you had actually seen Jesus die, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have said, who is that? You would have said, what is that? They beat the Lord until he didn't look like a human anymore. So it's not like these pictures of a crucifix you see. It's not like that. Where his face is all clear and there's just a little bit of blood driven down. Mm -mm. That's not how Jesus died. They beat Jesus so badly until he didn't look human anymore. That's why the Lord's death was so br brutal. That's why they whipped him. They spit on him. 
and that's why he had to die for six hours because every the entire enormous weight of sin had to be dumped on him. He had to take it in his own body, which also shows you that there's no way that because the Bible says he offered himself up through the eternal spirit. The Holy Ghost was there helping Jesus die because there's no way anybody, any human could take all that. That was done by the power of the spirit to allow Jesus to take all that punishment. So get that in your head. He did not just die on the cross for your sins. He died it for he died for sin and everything that came with it. Okay? And so that's why the Lord is saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a servant that owed millions of dollars worth of debt and came and begged forgiveness of the master. And the master took pity and the master said, I, I cancel the debt. I forgive you. You're free to go. That won't have any meaning to you until you understand the weight of debt that God has canceled on our behalf because of the sacrifice of Christ. I wouldn't want to see a list of my sins. I'd just hang my head in shame and fall on the ground and try to turn my back and not look at it. I wouldn't want God to lay my sins. I'm talking about me, David. I'm talking about nobody else. Me, David. I wouldn't want God to lay my sins out in order in front of me. I just hang my head and start bawling, probably start screaming and fall on the ground. That's what's going to happen to people that are unsaved, by the way. In final judgment, God's going to do exactly that. He's going to lay out every sin you ever did in front of you. That's why another reason why there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> because you're going to have to face everything you did from the time you started making decisions. Even kids aren't off the hook, if you didn't know that. How do I know that's true? Because when God got ready to destroy the world in the floodwaters of Noah, he said, I have examined man and his thoughts are evil continually from his youth up. God looks into the hearts of young people to see what they're thinking and feeling. Your age is not an excuse before God. That's what people tell you. Oh, well, you're young, that ain't what God said. If you die and you're not saved, when you stand before Father and Son and Holy Ghost in judgment, they're going to show you a list of all of your sins from the time you started making decisions. So if you live to be 100 years old, that's a lifetime. See, see, just thinking about that makes me tremble and fear. That's what's waiting for you if you die outside of Jesus Christ. So if I was you, I would get saved right now. I would not wait one more day. Why would you wait till you die and face God with the weight of all your sins still on you when Jesus took all that weight on him? Why? If you don't accept, if you don't, this is uh, what I told my son when my son became a Christian. I said, son, it's really simple. You know that there are good things and bad things we do in life, right? He said, yes. I said, you know, those bad things that we do, those are called sins. You understand that? He said, yes. I said, either you can pay for that yourself or you can believe that Jesus paid for it and avoid the penalty of hell. My son raised his hand and said, I'll take Jesus and got saved as a child. Because it's not complicated. Either you going to pay for all the sin that you've done, or you can believe that Jesus already paid and accept his payment as your forgiveness ticket, your forgiveness coin, your forgiveness. I don't have to go to hell because Jesus went to hell for me. If I was you listening to me right now, I'll get saved right now. So here's what to do. Getting saved is as simple as A, B, C. A, admit. Admit that you are a sinner. Go before God and say, Father God, I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. I have sinned against you and you only. B, believe. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he died on the cross for sin. C, confess. Confess that with your mouth as you believe it in your heart. A, B, C. Admit, believe, confess. That is how you get born again. That's how you get saved. You can do that right now. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Those of you that want to get saved right now, repeat what I'm saying. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. I come before you. I admit that I am a sinner. I was born in sin and I have sinned against you every day of my life. But Father, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son 
and I believe he died on the cross for all sin. And now I accept that. I receive that in my heart. I believe that you have forgiven me through him. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is now my Lord and Savior. And I believe you have wiped my sins from my account. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Okay? So if you're watching this broadcast live or if you're watching at any point in the future, if you want to be saved, do what I just did. That's how you get born again. It's ABC. That's why it's such a shame to die and go to hell when it's that easy to get saved. Not that your salvation was easily won. Jesus had to go through all that. The Lord was arrested on a Tuesday night, beaten, cane, spit upon, had all his clothes stripped on him, whipped out a whipping post, kicked. Then they woke him up Wednesday morning and they beat him some more before they crucified him. I don't know if you knew that. They crucified Jesus at 9 o'clock in the morning. That means they got up before 9 o'clock and beat him some more. 9 o'clock in the morning, they nailed him out there on that cross. And the Lord stayed on the cross from 9 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then he said, it's finished. And then he died. Okay? So, if he went through all that to make it that easy for me to get born again, why would, <laughs> why would you not want to be saved? Because if you're not saved, God has a list of your sins that he's going to confront you with and you're going to have to pay. You're going to have to pay sin by sin, choice by choice, word by word, because you did not accept the blood of Jesus as the payment of the debt. So this parable, uh, the servant, God is, the Lord is not just talking about forgiveness, but he has to help us understand the weight of sin, the weight of the debt that God is actually forgiving. And then this parable goes on to say that that same man that the master just forgave that $10 million dollars, met another servant who owed him money, and he owed him 100 silver and coins or 100 denarii. And uh, one denarii was about a day's wages at that time. So that was about three months, three months and a week worth of, uh, worth of money. So you had worked for a quarter, January, February, March. He owed him that paycheck. Now, he just got forgi forgiven of, you know, $10 million or so, and that man owed him you know, three months worth of uh, paycheck. This man uh, said he refused. He, when he confronted him, he grabbed him, he choked him. <laughs> uh, he said, pay me that money you owe. And the, the servant that owed the original man fell on the ground and said the same thing to him that that man said to the master. Be patient with me and I'll pay it back. But he said, nope. He threw him in the debtor's prison. And when the other servants saw what happened, they went and told the master. And the master called the servant and said, you wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And then Jesus says this verse. And I know they don't teach that much on this verse because I know some of y'all, this first time in your life, you ever heard it. The Lord said, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you, each of you, unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. One more time, because I know we miss it. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you. Unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. So the Lord is teaching us through this prayer. Remember, I told you this is no more genies. You need to get rid of that genie concept you got of God and listen to what the word actually says. The Lord says that the kingdom of heaven is a place that you can get forgiveness of all your debts and your sins just because you ask God to. You fall down on your face and you humble yourself before Father God. I know this is the truth because I know God is merciful. And I know that God himself is humble. He's not puffed up. That's us, not him. God is merciful and God is humble. And when you humble yourself, before God, and when you bow down before God Most High, He will have mercy on you because He's a good God. He's good. He's a good God. And He will have mercy on you and forgive you your debt. But then the Lord says that if you do that and then turn around to somebody that owes you something and grab them by their neck and choke them and say, You better pay me what you owe me. You better pay me what you owe me. They said, Okay, okay, chill. Just be patient with me. Uh, I'll give you everything. And you say, nope. And you call the cops and you take them and you throw them in a debtor's prison and you say, you're going to pay me everything you owe when God hears about that. 
when God sees you treat your fellow man like that, then the Lord says, he gonna turn in his anger, he's going to turn you over to the jailers to be tortured until you pay all that you owe. Now, I don't know how that translates in terms of practicality. God could send you a spirit of torture. God could send enemies in your life and because God put the sword on King David. After King David had uh, Uriah killed, God said, now the sword shall never depart from thy house. God could decree that you're going to have war in your family until you die. You, you ain't going to never have peace. There's so many things God could do, but the Lord says, that's how Father God going to treat you if you won't forgive your fellow man. That's what the kingdom of heaven is really like. That means there's going to be a whole lot of folks when we get over to the other side, going to have a lot of answering to do if you hold them grudges, them lifelong grudges. Well, something happened when I was nine years old, and eh, okay, well, maybe it's time to forgive and let it go. Maybe it's time to forgive and let it go. Maybe it's time to show love and kindness. Maybe it's time to show mercy like your heavenly father has shown mercy to you. If you don't want to do that, then the Lord said that God's going to let you be tortured for all that you owe because you wouldn't forgive as he has forgiven you. That's what it's really like. So that's what I'm trying to get you to understand. We need to see what the word actually says and get rid of all this genie, this magic mess that says that we have no responsibility for forgiveness. We ask Father God to forgive us and he forgives us of millions of sins. And then we get so petty we can't forgive our fellow man, especially our families, or should I say more uh, accurately, our relatives. What do I mean by that? I mean, ain't no fights like family fights. If you mad at your parents, if you mad at your brother or your sister, if you mad at your cousins, your aunts and your uncles, you can stay mad for 20, 30 years. Don't want to go to the reunion, don't want to go to no birthday celebration, don't even want to go to no family funerals because you hate them so much because you won't forgive them. Well, you don't understand what they did to me. I do understand that we are often cruel to the people we're related to the most. I do understand that. And it doesn't mean you have to be in fellowship with them if they're toxic. That's not what that means. That's another thing that Christian people have taught, that it means you have to stay in fellowship. No, you don't. You don't have to stay in fellowship with toxic people, but it's talking about forgiving the debt so you're not carrying that bitterness in your heart. Not letting them in your life or you staying in their life when they're continually poisoning you. No. Nowhere does God teach that. But he does say that we need to learn how to forgive the debts of others as Heavenly Father has forgiven us. And if God sees us trying to beat people and put them in jail and hold them down to the penny because we won't let a couple hundred dollars go, and even if it gave you of tens of millions, then Father God's going to have a problem with that. So this is why we need to teach what the Word of God actually says and what the kingdom of God is actually like and what Jesus taught. He taught the kingdom. And so now you see from his teaching tonight that if you're not saved, you need to get saved right now. Don't waste one, one more day of your life with God writing down everything that you say and do. And then you meet him with no blood of Jesus on your account to cover all that debt. One. Number two, if you have accepted and received the blood of Jesus and Father has forgiven us, then we need to examine our hearts and be sure that we're not holding grudges. You know, every child has a list of all the things my parents did wrong. Every kid does. And most of the time you hold that list until you become a parent yourself. <laughs> then the script flips and you see what it was like from the other side of the table and then you might lighten up a little bit. But most of us, it takes 30 or 40 years before you calm down and grow up enough to realize that your parents are people and your parents are human too and they're not perfect. Most of us keep our list of all the wrong things my parents have done to me uh, through your teens, through your 20s, and at least halfway, if not all the way through your 30s. Most people are late 30s, early 40s, maybe, and that's if you forgive. Most people are late 30s, early 40s before they finally forgive their parents. Well, I stop by to tell you, you need to forgive your parents. Because our great parent, our great father, our holy father in heaven has forgiven us of tens of millions. I'm going to say it again. I wouldn't want to see the list of my sins. I wouldn't want God to show me that. As King David says in the Bible, if thou, O Lord, should mark iniquity, who could stand? So that's why I want to do like Jesus taught. I don't want to be like the wicked servant that won't forgive. I want to be a wise servant 
that learns how to forgive. Because remember, this whole thing started out when Peter asked Jesus how many times should I forgive? Seven times, and Jesus said until 70 times seven, or 77 times in some translations. But the Lord is basically saying you need to have a forgiving spirit. You need to not be one of those people that is uh, petty and, and keeping a record of wrong done, wrongs done, which is one of the things that love does. Love keeps no record of wrongs done. You see that? Because this is your future. This is your future when you are still carrying stuff in your heart. Father God is going somehow, because remember that God is unlimited. Father God is going to somehow put something on you for all the debt that you owe because you wouldn't forgive your fellow man. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. I don't want to wait until after I die and then meet people on the other side and say, I'm sorry. I'd rather say, I'm sorry now. I'd rather humble myself now and be done with it and walk in forgiveness. Okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you thanking you for your unlimited mercy. Just with, with very sober hearts right now, oh God, as we tend to be so petty and unforgiving. So I just ask you, Father, for me and for all those, those that are willing and agreeable to this prayer, that you would show us anything we're still carrying in here, for we have not forgiven from our hearts. In honor of the fact that Jesus paid for our debt, and that debt is into the millions, the billions, the trillions that we don't want to see a list of all the things you've forgiven us for. We couldn't take it. So show me and show all that agree with this prayer that if there's anything we're still carrying in here where we are hateful against our fellow man, help us to forgive. Help us to forgive. Not, you know, I know that you don't teach us that we have to keep a toxic person into our lives, but help us to forgive from here so we don't, we don't incur your wrath against being abusive to our fellow man. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, I'm going to go into the Holy Ghost and ask the Holy Ghost if there's anything else I need to release. And that'll be it for this week. All right. All right. Didn't get anything in particular. All right. And I was also talking to the Lord about, you know, my, my heart. I want to make sure my heart is right as well. So um, I know that uh, on the podcast or anything audio, that gap, you know, so I normally edit that out. But that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm praying in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost. Okay. So praise God for this teaching. This teaching has been sobering. This teaching is life changing. I hope. Anybody that watches it, I mean, a hundred years after I'm dead, if they still have YouTube videos. I'm hoping that when you see this teaching, you repent on the spot and get saved. And receive God's gracious offer of forgiveness through the blood of Christ. And never have to stand before a holy God with a list of your sins between you and him. And those of us that are already Christians, I hope that we can learn how to walk in the spirit of forgiveness. So that even when we do have beef with people... We learn how to work it out. We learn how to let it go. We learn how to get past it. So we can be like our Heavenly Father in Heaven, which forgives us of our debts. Okay? Amen and amen. Thank you for joining me live. Those of you that watch me live on Facebook and Periscope and Twitter. And praise God. Uh, blessings to you for those of you that watch the replay. Um, as always, I tell you what projects I have going on. And my prophetic devotional is out. And this thing is really moving. Like, it sold out like... In the first uh, place I had it in church, you know, people are buying these off the website. This is a daily prophetic devotional that allows you to meditate on a prophetic scripture every day. Three different translations. You can write down what the Holy Spirit tells you. And then uh, you can go back later and see when the word has come to pass. 
That's how you increase your faith in the prophetic. When you see God's word come to pass, you need to write it down. Write down and date when the Lord told you something. And then write down when it happens. And you will find your faith in the prophetic increased and strengthened in ways you never saw before. And you will also see how much prophetic is in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Okay? So every day there's a prophetic scripture even having to do with a, a, an actual prophecy or a prophet and their experience. Um, a lot of people don't know that Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman, the Caillou woman, the woman of valor, woman of strength, is a prophecy. It's a prophecy. Go back and read it. The prophecy that King Lemuel's mother taught him. So prophetic is all through the Bible, so you need to walk in it. You need to stop thinking that being prophetic is just prognostication telling the future. Prognostication telling the future is a subset of prophecy. To prophesy means to speak by divinely inspired utterance. It means to speak by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist was a prophet. He was not about the future. John the Baptist was about the present. And he preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because Jesus, the Lamb of God, was on earth. And John the Baptist was trying to call the attention to all the people around him that Jesus is here now. So it's time to follow him. His, his prophetic preaching was not, not about the future, it was about the present. So you will find that, uh, you will discover that as you go through the book, as you go through different days and you meditate on scriptures and you, you ask the Holy Ghost to show you, to open up that scripture to you and you write down what he says and then later on you come back journal style and say today, today this happened and then you'll have a whole journal of God showing you how the prophetic works and so people have been buying it up, it's been flying off the shelves, as you can tell I'm very proud of it but I'm giving all the glory to God, I'm taking no glory for myself because it was his idea. He gave me the idea, and I'm just proud to be used to get that done. I also am dropping new music tracks. You can support me on Patreon. My Patreon name is patreon.com slash shades of the cross. And you, you can watch a video about what Shades of the Cross is. That's my multi-ethnic musical group that I've had in one form or the other since 93. Okay? And uh, so got a lot of music I'm dropping. I just dropped a track on Sunday called Lost City. It was a gospel rap track. So that's on my YouTube channel, Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross. So I'll put all those links below here on Facebook, and I'll put them on Twitter as well. But I want you to check the music out, too, because I'm bringing my music ministry back to the forefront, okay? Because people that are just meeting me now don't know that I've been doing music my whole life. I've been doing music since I was a child and in choir since I was like 14 years old, and I was assistant conductor of the University of Illinois Black Horse, and and I was in the vocal honors group when I was in Trinity. And there's a lot I've done, but music has been a part of my life since a child. And so I'm bringing that ministry back to the forefront too, okay? So God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this ministry has been a, a blessing to you. If you want to sow into my ministry, my zeal is prophetdavidtaylor at gmail.com. Or you can support me on Patreon or if you buy a prophetic devotional or just watch some YouTube videos, that helps. But any way you want to bless me, I want you to know I appreciate it and I don't take it for granted. It's not a small thing. It's a serious thing. And so I just want to say thank you for all the ways that uh, people who have supported me have supported me. And there's so much more I'm going to do. So just to let you know that, okay? All right, God bless you. I will see you Sunday in my regular time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the Weekly Live Prophetic Word. And remember, you can get all this information on my website, prophetdavidtaylor.org. My music is there. Videos are there. Prophetic devotional is there. Weekly Live Prophetic Word is there. Podcast is there. No More Genies is there. Everything I do in my prophetic ministry is on my website, prophetdavidtaylor.org. So go there and you can see all of the stuff in one place. Okay? Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great night. And I'll see you, Lord willing, on Sunday.